Welcome to the services of Glendale Presbyterian Church, located at 9218 State Highway 83 North in Defuniac Springs, Florida. Sunday school is at 9.30 a.m. with Sunday services at 11 a.m. Wednesday night services are the first and third Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 1. If you're using your church Bible, page 1017, Luke chapter 1. As has already been mentioned, uh, last night was just a special celebration of the birth of our Savior in a very uh, unique way. But any time a baby's born, it's a time of excitement. Uh, some in our church family have experienced that. Uh, think about the Parson family with Alan and Jennifer having a newborn and Holly expecting just about any day now. <laughs> They're looking forward to that addition. Uh, Brittany expecting another uh, soon. And uh, we're just... Uh, thrilled about that. Uh, most of you know we're expecting our grandson January the 4th and looking forward to that new addition uh, to our family. It's just an exciting time when the birth of a baby is involved. The miracle of birth. And this morning we want to read about another miraculous birth from Luke chapter 1 our reading picks up in verse 57. Luke chapter 1, verse 57. Now, the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by that name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet. And he wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all the neighbors. And all these things were talked about throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of the holy prophets from on old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of the enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you child will be called the prophet of the most high for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, when the, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit and he was in the wilderness until the days 
of his public appearance, appearance to Israel. And the grass withers and the flower fades, but this is the word of our God that stands forever. Would you pray again with me, please? Father, thank you that we have a sure word from you. That in the midst of this season and all the hectic things going on around us, I thank you that we have a solid foundation in the word of God to us. So, Father, help us as your people to hear what you have for us this morning. And then just as we read with Zechariah and Elizabeth, help us to respond accordingly. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. It has indeed been a hectic nine months for this young, I shouldn't say young, for this old couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Nine months earlier, Zechariah was providentially chosen to be the priest to come and offer incense at the altar. Of the thousands of priests that could have been chosen, he was the one. And as he's standing there inside the temple at the incense altar, Gabriel, the angel, appears to him and says to him, uh, God has heard your prayers. And you and Elizabeth will bear a son in your old age. And you shall name him John. And then when Zechariah wavered in unbelief because of this amazing news, the angel pronounced a judgment on him. Gabriel said, you will not be able to speak a word until all these things are fulfilled. He goes back home. Soon after that, Elizabeth conceives. At first she tries to hide her pregnancy from her neighbors and her family. But as you know, after a while, it's hard to hide those things. And word started getting around. In her sixth month of pregnancy, her cousin Mary came to visit her and they were able to share a, a time of bonding without the interruptions of uh, Elizabeth's husband, Zechariah. He could not speak, remember. And now our text picks up. And according to what we read in verse 56, it appears that Mary went back home to Nazareth after being there for three months. It appears she goes back home to her home, Nazareth, right before John is born. It could be that uh, during this crucial time, there was just so much going on, she didn't want to be another distraction. And so, she leaves, and now even though Elizabeth has tried to be hush-hush about her pregnancy, everybody gets the word, and the neighborhood is buzzing with anticipation. And now Luke begins this section we just read by simply stating the fact that the time had come and Mary give, uh, excuse me, Elizabeth gives birth to a son. Notice verse 58. And her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. Now, nine months earlier, as Gabriel is standing with uh, Zechariah in the temple, he told him, if you look back at verse 14, he told him, the, bir the birth of your son will bring rejoicing to all the people. And here we see that happening. Uh, at this time of the new birth, it's, uh, it it's wonderful to have a, a team of supporters around you. And that's exactly what Elizabeth had. And by the way, that's how the church should be. We should be rallying around those who are going through a time like this. And I gotta tell you, as a church, I am uh, very uh, excited when I see you folks uh, rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. Because that's how the church is supposed to function. Well, as the uh, Jewish custom was, a newborn male 
would be circumcised on the eighth day. And apparently some families within that event of circumcision also included it as a uh, baby naming ceremony. And so Luke says that they, verse 59, referring back to those relatives and neighbors of verse 58, they planned to name the baby Zach Jr. They were going to name the baby after the father. It just seemed like the natural thing to do. And remember, Zachariah has been unable to speak for nine months. But notice Elizabeth speaks up, and she says no to Zach Jr., but rather she says, he shall be called John. Apparently sometime during that nine months, Zechariah had got his tablet, which he used quite a lot during that period, and he wrote on that tablet to his wife Elizabeth what the angel had said, that the baby was to be named John. Now you're probably aware they didn't give much credit to women in that culture. At the very best, they were second class citizens. But you would think Zechariah's wife, you would think the mother of this baby, all she's been through the last nine months, you would think she would get the last word on the naming of the baby. But notice they didn't take her answer as the final word. They argued with her. Elizabeth, nobody in your family is named John. Not your father, not your grandfather. You don't have any uncles named John. You don't have any cousins named John. Do you know anybody named John? And they argue with her. And then they go to Zechariah and they ask him. In verse 62, it says they made signs to him. That tells us one of two things is happening. Either he's also deaf. Or they're just overcompensating for his handicap, which we do quite a lot. And so they begin making signs to him instead of just asking him. They make these signs about what the baby's to be born. He calls for his writing tablet again. And probably in big letters, he writes, his name is John. Big letters. No fancy explanation, just four words. And the people were astonished, it says. John, the name means Jehovah is gracious. And so after nine months of suffering, the consequences of his unbelief, Zechariah has now come, he's turned a corner. He now believes what God said that came through the angel and he obeys. He names the baby John, and immediately Dr. Luke says his tongue was loosed and his mouth was open. Typically, a family waits to see what the baby's first words will be. In this case, they're waiting to see what the father's first words will be. And notice Luke says his first words were, praise to our God. And with all these amazing events going on around them, Luke says the neighbors responded with, man, what, what will his child be then? For the hand of the Lord is with him. Then in verse 66, just like we saw earlier with Elizabeth, Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he uh, begins this song. And there's similarities between the song he sings to the same song that Mary sang and also Elizabeth sang. It's a song of praise to our God for working on their behalf. The theme of the song we see in that very first phrase. For the Lord God has visited us and he has redeemed his people. Now that song is in like two parts or two stanzas. The first stanza, Zechariah is praising God for his plan of redemption. And then in the second stanza, starting in verse 76, Zechariah gives a description of what his son John will be like 
in the uh, playing out of, of God's plan. God's plan of redemption. So let's consider that first stanza. Verse 69. God has visited us. He's redeemed our people. Then he says, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us. That horn was a symbol of great strength. Just like a great beast. A horned beast who has the power to drive out the enemies. Has the power to deliver his people. That's what Zechariah is saying. God's salvation will do for them. Drive out their people. Provide redemption. Zechariah recalls the covenants that God made with uh, David and also with Abraham. And through both of those, he's recalling the faithful promises God made to his people. To uh, visit his people. To deliver his people and redeem them from sin. That's the first stanza. The second stanza, Zechariah begins speaking of his son John. Notice he says, uh, verse 76, uh, And you, child, the child that's just been born, will be called the prophet of the Most High. John the Baptist becomes the last of the Old Testament prophets. But also, his birth was the fulfillment of other Old Testament prophecies. For example, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Isaiah wrote, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway to our God. You see, it was a common practice in those days that when a king was coming, when royalty was coming, they would build a processional highway, a straight way to make his entrance smooth into the city. And Zechariah says, uh, Isaiah says in his prophecy, that's what John the Baptist, that's what his ministry will be all about. He will be preparing people for the coming of the Lord. Making a straight highway. That's his mission. The Apostle John wrote about John the Baptist in John chapter 1. This is what he wrote. He says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about that light that all might believe through him. He was not that light. But he came to bear witness about that light. So John's mission was preparation. How did he carry that out? By confronting people about their sin. By confronting people about their need for forgiveness. He was all about pointing people to the Savior. In fact, in John chapter 1, as John the Baptist is ministering there at the Jordan River, Jesus comes walking through the crowd, and John points to him. And John says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John was all about. Lifting Jesus up. In fact, in John chapter 3, verse 30, he said to the people, He must increase, I must decrease. John's ministry, preparing people for the coming of the Lord. John grows up in the wilderness, and then when he finally comes out, he begins his public ministry. And as he began his public ministry, and we'll talk more about this in some of the later chapters, John was not afraid to confront people about their sin. Because there in the crowd of John's preaching, was the self-righteous ones. The religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. And you know how John referred to them? He called them a brood of vipers. <laughs> Don't beat around the bush, John. Tell us what you think about these guys. A brood of snakes. The ones who thought 
that were good enough to earn favor before God because of their own self-righteousness. Zechariah says John will preach a message of repentance and forgiveness. Notice how Zechariah closes out his song, verse 78. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. It's a prophecy of the coming of Messiah. You see, even with all the excitement of the baby John being born, Zechariah is so caught up in that, but he says the most important thing is this. That's just leading the way, pointing us to the coming of the Messiah, the promised one. That he's going to come. And he says, up until now we've been in darkness, but now he says the light is coming. Jesus himself. Notice Zechariah says that he, the one he's pointing to, he calls him the sunrise who shall visit us from on high. He's the great light, John says. Zechariah says. He's the great light to the darkness of our world. The Apostle John said when Jesus comes, he is the true light. Jesus himself called a reference to himself and he said, I am the light of the world. And so Zechariah closes his song by saying it's his coming, verse 79, that will bring light to those in darkness who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And that is a wonderful picture, a wonderful metaphor that Luke gives us here. The picture is of a group of travelers that are on a journey at a time when there was no electricity and there was no light. And they find themselves overtaken by the deepest darkness. It's pitch black and they have not reached their destination. They're stuck. They don't know what to do. They don't know which way to go. And they sit down, realizing that at any time, wild beasts could come and attack them. Or at any time, in the darkness, their enemies could come and overtake them. And there they sit in the darkness. And as they sit there, someone comes carrying a light. Someone from the outside comes in and he says to them, here, let me guide you back to your destination. Let me take you on a path to peace. And the light leads them to safety. You see, that was the condition of the world when Zechariah and Elizabeth bore a son. The world was in darkness. The world was in silence from God. And then Jesus walked out on the stage of human history as the light of the world. And he says to those who are sitting in darkness, he says to those who are living in the shadow of death, he says, follow me. And as we look around our world today, as we look around our country today, there's a lot of darkness out there. I don't need to tell you that. You know all too well. And we need to be pointed to the light. And if you've received the light, if you know Jesus, 
then God may be calling you to be like a John the Baptist. Or to be like a Ronnie Wilson. And point people who are struggling in the darkness, point them to the light. To tell them a light has come. So brothers and sisters, as we go into this most wonderful time of the year, be reminded that Advent is a season of love. That it was because God so loved the world that he gave. Make sure our focus is on love as we think about the Lord who left heaven out of love for us. As we think about the Lord who came to be born as a baby in Bethlehem because of his love for us. As we think about the one who suffered and died because of his great love for us. Paul wrote it like this to the church at Rome and also to the church at Glendale. Romans 5 eight. But God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were sinners Christ died for us. Celebrate his birth this week but make sure you're following the true light. Let's pray together. Father thank you that years ago as some of us sat in darkness not sure where to go or what to do Thank you that someone brought the light to us. We certainly didn't deserve that. That was strictly grace and mercy and love and action. We thank you this morning, Father, for a Savior who was willing to leave the glories of heaven to come and be born into this world, to live a perfect life and then to die a death on the cross for us. Help us, Father, to demonstrate that kind of love as we go out from here. To be a light to those who are still sitting in darkness. To be pointing toward a path of peace to those who are troubled this morning. Help us to be the church you've called us to be. Father, we thank you for that great gift, for that light in the darkness. Help us as your people to be reflectors of that light, to be the light of the world so that others may see Jesus in us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Advent is a season of love. And hymn writer William Newell penned these words. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. That happened in eternity past when God chose to set his love upon us. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. That happened at Bethlehem. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. This morning as we come to the Lord's table, we have a wonderful picture of God's love for his people. Zechariah spoke of that, those covenants that God made with David and with Abraham. And now before us at the table is a picture of the new covenant that Jesus himself made with us. That as we put our trust in Jesus, we have that covenant promise that he will be our God and we will be his people.